Brought to you by the Pegwell Community Church of Christ Church in Barbados. Check us out on YouTube. You'll find whole lots of stuff there that will be beneficial to us. We are preaching about Jesus. Paul said we preach Jesus and him crucified. We are looking at some strange things that he said. Tonight I want to go back for just a minute or so to read about 10 verses that he said about hypocrites before we move on to something else. So let's see if we can pull up that in scripture because we want to make sure that we are not hypocrite. A hypocrite is one who wears a mask. A hypocrite is one who practices that which he's not. A hypocrite is one who will, you know, will tell you what to do while they're not doing it themselves. And so we want to go back to, to that. We looked last week at how to handle life's challenges. Adjust me, Adam. I'm getting echo. How to handle life's uh, challenges. We had some very good report on, on the messages both Sunday morning and Sunday night. We had strangers who came in, one lady from Maryland, another lady, and two other, or three other ladies from St. Vincent who walked up to me after the service up to the platform and declared how happy they were. They, they thought that they had died and gone home. And I'm saying in the back of my mind all the time, I wonder how come why your people don't think so about the message? Why a stranger has to come and tell you, you know, that messages are really, really good? I have an answer to that. Maybe they're not getting good stuff where they are. And maybe all people are jealous and they don't want to tell you, you know, that the messages are really helping. But one lady came to me after service and she said, you know, um, you've been speaking to me all day long. The messages are right up what is happening in my life. I want to thank God for that. Amen. Just receive the word. The Lord said, uh, the Lord Jesus said, you know, to some people who were skeptical about his preaching and his teaching. He said, look, if you don't believe me, believe me because of the miracles that you're seeing. So even Jesus did not believe. He said, you don't have to believe me. So I, I'll say the same thing. You don't have to believe me. Just believe the word of God. As long as you believe the word of God and act on the word of God, that's going to be fine. Monica, could you bring those scriptures up for me? When Jesus is talking about woe unto you, scribes. But wait, you have a reference. Somebody give me a reference quickly. Woe unto, unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Sh sh could you have me my Bible? And he said a number of things. Hallelujah. Just take down the logo and we're going to go. Hallelujah. Handling life's challenges successfully. That was part two. That was really, really, really good. I have some people on Monday mornings. Can't wait to get these things out. All right. Thank you. Good. We go back before, before that. This is not what I'm speaking about tonight, but I just want to draw this to your attention. Let's go back a little further. Hallelujah. Okay, let's, let's start there. Let's start there. We're looking at the things that Jesus said. Some strange things that he did. He said, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And I told you on Sunday night, you've got to remember that when I'm reading scripture, when I'm reading scripture, it is God talking to you. It is God's voice. You might be hearing my voice, but it is God that is talking to you. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is God that is speaking. And so as God speaks, we pay attention to what he says. We respect what he says. That's why in some churches when they go to read the word of God, everybody stands. Because God is speaking. If the prime minister is going to speak, you stand up. You know, so that, that's why people stand in the church. That's very, very good. But he says, whosoever exalts himself, lift himself up. You're going to be a base. But the person that humbles himself, he's going to be exalted. Verse 13. Let's go quickly. Verse 13. We, we want to get onto the first verse that talks about woe unto you, scribes. Okay. Woe unto you. The word woe means tribulation, trouble, anguish. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees were the religious people in the church. They were the religious people in the synagogue. The scribes actually wrote the scripture. And the Pharisees were more religious than anybody else. There were about six different types of Pharisees. And the one that they always remember were a group called the bleeders. They were always bleeding, face bleeding. Because they were too holy to look on women, look at women. So every time they saw a woman, they would close their eyes or, or, or walk right into a tree. Or walk into a building or something. So they were always bleeding. They were too holy to look at women. So these are two holy groups that he's talking about. And he said, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, you scribes. For you won't go on yourself, neither will you permit those that are entering to enter and don't forget the scripture for us is for us today next verse what unto you scribes pharisees hypocrites for you devour widows houses 
You go into the house of the widow, you take their pension. You go into the houses of the widow and you make them promises. You go into the houses of the widows and plan to work for them and don't do a good job or whatever. And then you come to church the next day and for a pretense you make long prayers. The Lord said you're going to receive greater damnation. Next verse. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. For you compass land and sea, you walk all over Barbados, all through Pilgrim Road and Parish Land, and you walk all through Oysters and Scarb and whatever, just to make one convert. And when you have made that one convert and they come to church, you make them twice more a child of hell than yourself. It's right there. Then he goes on, Woe unto you, you blind guys, who say, let, let's leave verse 16 and 17, go down to verse 18. We don't want to get complicated with those two verses. Next verse, verse 19. We look at some strange things that Jesus said. If Jesus had come to your church and preached this, next verse, you wouldn't invite him back at all. But he was telling the truth. And he was not telling to be uh, 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 to spoil what was going on. Next verse, he was, telling, he was t- saying this so that people would improve their lives. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You pay a tithe of, of anise and mint and cumin. Those are things that you, those are seasoning for food. And they even paid tithes on the seasoning for the food, and he's meant and coming. But he said, you've, you've, you've omitted the way to your matters of the law, which are, which are judgment, mercy, and faith. And he said, you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you ought to have done both of them. These you ought to have done and not to have undone, left the other undone. Next verse. You blind guides, you strain at a gnat. Today we'll probably say a mosquito. You're choking on a mosquito. And at the same time, swallowing a cow. You'd be surprised to know the small things that we pick on on church. So he said, you, you strain at a gnat. A gnat is something small, small like a mosquito. But then you, you choke on, on a cow. What unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the plate. But inside, you're full of extortion and excess. Extortion is overcharging. The Bible said extortioners will not see the kingdom of God. He said outside, you look at your, your plate. I come to your house and the, outside, the plate is clean on the outside. And the teacup is clean on the outside. But on the inside, what is inside is not profitable. He said, you blind Pharisee, first clean that which is within. We have the tendency today to always clean the outside first. We want the best clothes. We polish our shoes. We wear clean clothes. Our whites are really white. No spots or anything, you know. Uh, we, 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 t- we tend to look after the outside first. But he said, you, you blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is inside of the cup. And then uh, that the outside of them may be clean also. I wonder what the Lord is saying to us. Next verse, just two or three more verses before we start tonight. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, separates, for you are like whited tombs. Today we don't white them out. Today we put uh, tiles or we put whatever the other thing is we put on the, on the sepulchers. Marble. We make it look real good on the outside. Could you imagine the Lord looking in your face and say, you are like a whitest sepulcher. Now I said the Lord. I didn't say the pastor or the apostle or whatever. You could, you could imagine how bad that is. The Lord looks straight in your face. See you hypocrite. You're like a white, you're like a, a marble tomb. The outside look real nice. The people come, the tourists come and take pictures and everybody come and look at it and say, wow, look at that. But the Lord said when you open it and look inside, when he opens our hearts and look inside, you'll be surprised. Let's read it full, fully. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, separates, for you are like whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly. Hairstyle is well done. Face is well made up. Dresses are well made and shirts and suits and all that. Very costly and expensive. But the Lord said, but are within, in within that, that sepulcher is full of dead men's bone and all uncleanness. That's really sad. Even so, he says, you scribes, you also outwardly appear righteous to men. You look pious. You fold your hand. When the preacher is preaching and he speaks something that the Lord gets your attention about, instead of you talk to the Lord, you're praying for somebody else. You're either praying for the preacher or you're praying for the other people around you, but not you. You're scribe, Pharisees, hypocrite. When the Lord speaks to you directly, you'll bow your head and start praying for the preacher. Or you'll bow your head and start praying for everybody else. When you ought to be looking after yourself. This is what the Lord says. Uh, Go back. Go back to verse 28. Verse 28. Woe unto you, scribes. He said, even so you appear outwardly 
righteous to men. You don't speak to people. You don't shake people's hands. You don't associate with people because you are appearing to be righteous. You are pious. You are holier than anybody else. But God, who is speaking to us tonight, said, but within, you should look at your heart. You should look at your heart. It is full of hypocrisy and iniquity. It's full of deceit. It's full of backbiting and backstabbing. It's full of nastiness. But outside, I, I'm just reading. I'm just reading. But out, outside, it looks real clean. Next verse. We're going to finish here now. Woe unto you, scribes, for our saints, hypocrites. Because you build the tombs of the prophets and you, you decorate the sepulchres of the righteous. That's how you deal with, with the prophets and the righteous people. You kill them. You and your parents kill them. And you are saying, well, if I was living in that day, I would not, I would not do that. Yeah, you would do that, the Bible says. The, 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 the Lord, they say, if, if I had been in the days of my father, who killed the righteous and who killed the prophets, if I was in those days, we would not have been partakers with them. Oh, yeah? It's happening up to today. We would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. They're still killing the prophets today. They're still murdering the prophets today. Prophets are still having a hard time. If you declare you're going to, de if you declare you're going to have a gospel, you're going to preach the gospel, and God has called you to, to preach the gospel. There's some of you that I sent a little note to this morning. By the way, I send some little notes to some of you sometimes, not to everybody, but when it comes to you, it is that I want you to know that I am not the only person saying that. I want you to know that this is scripture. I want you to know that this is what's happening in other churches. So I will send it to you so that you will know uh, that, that Peg Well Community Church is not making up stuff. All right, so every now I don't send to everybody because I don't have the time. But if I think that I want you to know something, I will send you. And so we saw one this morning that I sent out to you. Uh, so let's leave from there now and continue to talk about Jesus. We're going to be talking about Jesus for a little while. Tonight, let's look at what Jesus said about prayer. And we want to spend about 20 minutes tonight, or if we have the time, in prayer because we got to get past the puny little prayers that we are praying. There are heavy weights to be lifted today, and you're not going to be lifted. You're not going to be able to lift them with muscles that are not, you know, that are not strong. We got to do something with our prayer life. We got to pray a little bit longer, be more intense. So let's start here. We don't know how far we're going to get. Uh, Luke chapter 18 and verse one. I'm going to read an extended portion because I want you to get the scripture. The Bible said that you ought to always have an answer. To give the person who asks you the hope of why you are serving God. Why are you serving God? What are you going to tell them? So that's why I'm reading the scripture. Verse 1. And Jesus spake a parable. This is a parable. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus spake a parable to this end. That men ought always to pray. Always and not to faint. The word faint means to lose heart. So Jesus is introducing the idea of prayer. Uh, when the disciples asked him to pray, he said, this is how you should pray. Not that you should pray this, but this is how you should pray. This is in Matthew chapter 6, but stay here. Luke, I'm coming back. He said, this is how you should pray. Our Father, your prayer should not be addressed to Jesus. Your prayer should always be addressed to the Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You begin to praise the name of the Lord because all the names of the Lord mean something. Whether it's Adonai, whether it's uh, Jehovah Jireh, whether it's Yahweh, you praise, you build up the lift, they lift up the name of Jesus. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Pray about the kingdom of God because the kingdoms of this world are so corrupt. We need to pray about the kingdom of God and pray that God's kingdom will be established on the earth. Thy kingdom come. We also need to pray, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What you see happening on earth today is certainly not happening in heaven. The violence and the crime, that's not happening in heaven. And Jesus taught us that we should pray, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done uh, uh, on earth as it is in heaven. And notice that all those verses pertain to God and his kingdom. Now we are going to go into petition. Give us this day our daily bread. And that does not only mean natural food, rice, cuckoo, and salt fish, but it also means spiritual food because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We're talking about Jesus telling us about prayer tonight. Give us this day our daily bread. And then he move on to some other spiritual things. And forgive us our debts. Forgive us our trespasses 
As we for us, notice the word as, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lord, you forgive me to the same extent as I forgive those who trespass against me. How many understand what I just said? We want to go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness, but we don't want to forgive anybody else. It doesn't work like that. And if you don't forgive, by the way, you're not going to heaven. That's what the Lord says. Forgive your brother that you also might be forgiven. If you're not forgiven, then you're not going to make it in. How many, time, how many times should we forgive? 70 times 7. And that's just a figure. You don't multiply that and say, well, 440, 490 times. If it's 490 times, it's 490 times in every hour. Every time your brother trespasses against you, you ought to forgive him. You have to. You don't have any choice. Because, because if you don't, you're not going to make it to the pearls of glory. So you better learn to forgive. No matter what somebody does against you, you better learn to forgive. Because, like I always say, to miss heaven is not worth it. All right? Forgive us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Then you go on and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power is yours, the glory is yours forever and ever. That was a, that's a model prayer. We should pray like that. In this particular text, he wants to tell us something. He wants that some troubles are coming against somebody here, and he wants to tell them how to overcome. Troubles are coming against you as well. If troubles are not coming against you, you're not saved. If troubles are not coming against you, you are not saved. Pastor, you could say that, oh, the Bible says that all that will live godly and righteous in Christ Jesus will do what? So if you are suffering nothing, you are living righteous and godly. You could dress as much as you want to dress up. You could do whatever you want to do. If you are not going through troubles, many are the afflictions of who? If you are not going through afflictions, you are not saved. I can boldly say that because of the scripture. If everything is fine for you, you are not saved. If we suffer with him, we will reign with him. There's suffering in the bargain. If you call yourself a child of God, uh, the Bible tells us that we will be persecuted because we no longer run to the same extent as those who are unsaved. But because you are unsaved with them, unsaved people do not give you any trouble. But if you come to know Jesus and you, you, you're, you're born again, you have to have trouble. I don't understand why people don't understand that. I don't bother too much about trouble. I don't really care. Because you know something is coming. Why are you going to pull up here? You know, learn how to handle it. We'll probably talk about that at the funeral. This might be a strange message. Huh? So he spoke to them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Let him, let, let, let him explain that. Verse 2. There was in the city, this is what he's saying, there's a parable. There was in the city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. He didn't care about anybody. This judge did not care. He was a law unto himself. Okay? And there was a widow in the city, and she came to him all the time. Avenge me of my adversary. These people move my landmark. Make sure that they put it back. My family robbing me of my property. But the Bible said, and he, verse 4, would not pay her any mind for a while. But after he said to himself, you know what? I don't fear God. I don't regard man. Yet because this widow troubleth me. Brethren, you got to spend some time troubling God. You pray for five minutes and no more words don't come to your mouth and you're done. It can't work like that. Prayer can't work like that. you got to trouble and trouble. Okay, if you finish now, then come back in five minutes time. Because this man, because this widow troubleth me. I would arise, I would adventure, less by her continual coming. That's what your prayer life ought to be, continually coming. Morning, noon, and night, you ought to be before, before the Lord crying. And I'm calling tonight for a deeper walk with the Lord, a deeper prayer life. I'm calling tonight for more than just a little popcorn prayers that we give. They're not going to accomplish anything. All right? Uh, so, it, it, uh, Yet because, verse 5, because this widow troubleth me, I will, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she wearies me. No, not, not that we could weary God, huh? It's not, this, this is a contrasting parable. Okay? And the Lord said here what this unjust judge says. And shall not God, the real God now, avenge his own elect, which cry how often? Day and night unto him. 
That's how we should be praying. And God is going to avenge us. He's going to respond. He's going to answer. I tell you, verse 8, that he will avenge them speedily. Nonetheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Now that was good. But he didn't finish there. Look at the second part. Verse 9. Jesus is again speaking the parable to, uh, to certain people who trusted in themselves. When they talk what people trust in themselves, you should see the looks that I get sometimes. But it's really true. Look, it's right here in the Bible. Some people come to church and say, there's nobody like them. They're trusting in themselves. And you're wasting their time if you're doing that. You've got to learn to trust in God. Anybody understand what I'm saying? All right. Uh, he spoke a, a parable to certain that trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they hated everybody else. There's nobody else like me. They were righteous. Do you see that in verse 9? No, no, am I making this up? Am I making this up? They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Jesus is speaking, not Pastor Merle. And verse, verse 10, and this is what he says. Jesus is saying, two men went up to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, a highly religious fella. He's sitting at the right hand of God. One is a Pharisee, the other is a publican. The publican is a tax collector. The publican is a thief. The publican is employed by the Roman government to receive taxes. They want the hundred dollars that you owe them, but the, you could charge up to five hundred. Give them the hundred, and you could keep the four hundred. How many understand what I just said? Who's going to like a tax man like that? As long as the Romans got their hundred, they could charge you up to five hundred and keep the other four. So they didn't like. They didn't like. So here you have a righteous, righteous, holy, holy person, and the other one on the other side you have a scumbag. Anybody listen to me? Let's see what's going to happen here. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with who? With himself. He prayed with him. He ain't praying to God. He prayed with himself. Because uh, he's righteous and despised. Did we not just read that? That he was righteous in verse 9 and despised everybody else. So he prayed with himself and he said, God, the Pharisee, the righteous religious man, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. What are you praying about other men for? Lord, I'm glad I'm not an extortioner. Did I just talk about extortion? Lord, I'm glad I'm not an extortioner. Lord, I'm, I, I'm glad that I'm not unjust. Lord, I'm glad that I'm not an adulterer. I don't live with anybody's wife. I don't live with anybody's husband. I'm sitting inside of your right hand. I, I, I'm not even as this publican. This, this fellow is a bold brute. I'm not even like this publican here inside of me in church. This, those attitudes still, adjust, uh, uh, still exist today in church. Those attitudes still exist today in church. But look at this. He went on to verse 12. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I possess. Do you see how many times he said I? I is an indication of pride. I, everything about me. I, 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 I. I do this. I do that. I do the other. But look at the publican now who's this comeback. Nobody don't like publicans. That's why Zacchaeus, when Zacchaeus got saved, he said, Lord, I'm going to pay back people four times as much as I took from them. Because he had it. He had taken it from them. But don't let's get to Zacchaeus right now. Verse 12, verse 13. The publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven. Now that's not so with the, with the Pharisee. And the Pharisee is a religious person. Know all the laws of the temple. Knows everything. I, 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 I would not lift him. He would not lift up his eyes as much to heaven. But he smote his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the way to go. If you're going to pray tonight, that's how you should pray. We always want to pray for somebody else. That's good. Pray one for another. But there's a time that you need to go to God for yourself. But let me continue here. Verse, verse, verse 4. That's all he said, though, you know. He didn't say anything else. But paying ties or he didn't say anything like that. And, and verse 4, he says, I tell you that this publican's come back. Okay? Uh, went to his house justified. In case you don't know, the word justify means to declare righteous. In other words, when you're justified by God, you stand before God. Not other members in the church. Not other members of the church. You stand before God as though you had never sinned. That's what the word justify means. That's why the Bible said in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. We are not going there. Therefore being justified by faith. 
we have peace towards God. I can have peace over my sin because I am justified. You can hold sin against me if you want to. You know I have anything else to do? I'm sorry for you. You can hold sin against me. I'm sorry for you. But I'm justified. I'm declared righteous. Listen, man, a minute before Hitler died, if he had repented, the Lord would justify him. And although he would murdered six million Jews, he would be in heaven now rejoicing. Justification is a major doctrine in the church. God declares you righteous. God declares you sinless when he justifies you. So this man here that was and I'm calling tonight a publican scumbag. Huh? He went home justified. No sin to his account at all. But that other righteous fella fasting twice a week and doing this and that. Let me continue to verse 14. This man went into his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. We are not learning that fast enough. And he that humbleth himself shall be. He that, let me read it again. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. It's just a matter of time. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, I want to dovetail with that text that Jesus gave. A passage, and this is the real passage that I want to get. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 30. Now, when you pray like God says you should pray, you'll be surprised to see the things that are available to us. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. The book of Jeremiah is called the book of John, for the, the gospel of John for the Old Testament. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, I'm going to give you verse 13, and then I'm going to go back to read from verse 1, so that you'll know what we're talking about. When you come to church, open up your heart, because there's always going to be food at the table here. There's always going to be food at this table. Always. You will never come here and find that you get warm over soup, and you don't get something. So open up your heart to receive from God. And like Jesus said, Jesus said, if you don't believe me, believe me for the work, say it. For the work that I do. If you don't want to believe me, believe me because I'm reading the Bible. All right? The point of the, my text tonight is seeking God with all of your heart. In other words, I'm trying to tell you that no matter how good you could pray, no matter how good you could pray, no matter what an excellent prayer you are, God is saying you're, you, you, you're making it yet. God is saying you really got to pray. So look at Jeremiah 20, 29, Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. I'm going to read from verse 1 in a minute, but let's get verse 13 first. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Let's all read verse 13 together, then I'm going to go back to verse 1. I really want us to spend a few minutes doing this. Everybody read, and? And you shall seek me. You could divide this how you memorize verses, huh? You could divide this into four. Go ahead, and you shall seek me. And find me, where you shall search for me, with all of your heart. And if you want to memorize that, you go back and look at certain keywords. Number one, you shall, you shall seek. Seek is, a, is different from just seeing. When you are seeking something, you're going under the bed, and you're putting the broom under the bed to pull up one, and if you're seeking something. The Lord Jesus has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Seeking something. There's some diligence. Seek. When you seek me, then you will find me. You'll find me. He's not just there. You don't find gold on top of the earth. If you want to find gold, you have to dig down into the dirt. That's women don't, people, women don't understand. That things that are just there exposed, and nobody ain't going to look for it. It's not considered to be valuable and worthwhile. Let me leave that there. Let me drop that there and move on. You shall seek me and find me. Then you shall search. Notice the word search. Notice also in scripture that there's something called couplets. Couplets are two. So you could put seek and search as couplets. Really meaning the same thing. Then you shall search for me. And then the last part is what I really, really want to get tonight. With all of your heart. Question. Are you seeking God with all of your heart? 
You're seeking God and the phone rings. What happened? Your cell phone rings when you're praying. What happened? You stop to answer the phone. If you were in the doctor's office and it rang, you wouldn't, you wouldn't answer it. Because you give the doctor more respect than you give to God. You understand? If you were in church, you would answer it. Because ring on the front seat sometimes. Huh? So let's see what Jeremiah is talking about here. Verse 1. Jeremiah 29. The Lord says some wonderful things in here. And if you don't get much more tonight, I want to continue on Thursday. But God wants us to seek, us, to seek him with all of our heart. Half-hearted prayer is not going to work. I'm here asking for some cooperation tonight. I'm asking for some persons tonight that are on the Lord's side. My question is, who's on the Lord's side? If you're on the Lord's side with all sorts of things that are happening, you pray for a week, and the shooting start for a week, and then they start back. Then you have all kinds of negative things happening in the world. If you don't pray with intensity, nothing is going to happen. They said the church is not doing anything. They had a big calling call program today. They were talking about the church. One man who I consider to be an idiot. Talking about the church is not saying anything and all that kind of stuff. I get the impression that he has never darkened the church door yet. But we have something to do. And it's not how they're marching. We could, you might be surprised to know how we could quietly. Listen, you know how you quietly infect a whole family by putting a little piece of gossip in somebody's ear? Nobody wants you to do that, but you infect a whole family just quietly like that. We could impact this whole world the same way. We have the opportunity. We come in contact with people. Let's go to verse 1 and see what's happening here. I'm in Jeremiah chapter 29, and I am in at verse 1. I can't even see where 29 begin. Oh, right over here. Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the residue of the elders which were carried away captive and to the priests and to the prophets and to the people who knew Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem. Now that verse one there is a loaded verse. It could be very offensive. Notice that Jeremiah uh, is going to send a letter. We're going to see what the letter is all about. Look at who he sends the letter to. Because people who have names in the church some authority go with that name. But they don't understand that with authority comes responsibility. People names in the church, whether you call Sunday school teacher or praise or worship leader or deacon or deaconess, you go on name, people look at you differently. But people don't understand that where there is, whatever is happening, you need to be in the forefront. You need to be in the forefront. That's you, look at this text. These are the words of the letter which Jeremiah sent. Number one, to the residue of the who? Residue of the who? Talk to me, talk to me. He sent the letter to the elders. This, this is not the general people yet. The elders, uh, which were carried away captive, and to who else? So we have the elders, we have the priests, and to who else? And to the prophets, and, and, then, and then to who? To all the people. You see how things happen in church? Listen, if the pastor says, Come in the night and everybody has some miracles to talk about. Everybody got a name, she got one. When the pastor said jump, if there's anybody at all that should be jumping, is anybody that, that, that take a microphone here? Anybody touches the microphone. You stand up to teach people, whatever. You should be the first. And you, this is not the first place where you see that the Lord is, is addressing people with names. Here we have the elders, the priests, and the prophets. And then... Now, when the Lord wanted to speak to the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, he didn't go speak to the people. He, he spoke to Moses. And Moses spoke to Aaron, his brother. And people that are in authority, God speaks to first. Well, if you ain't hearing God, you ain't hearing God. I, 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 can't, I can't do anything about that. If you're not hearing, you're not hearing. If you're not on board, you're not on board. And Jesus said, he that is not with me is scattering. So because they give somebody a name, it doesn't mean that they're with you anyway. Y'all very quiet tonight. Y'all getting Buckley's? Huh? This good teaching for me, say that myself. Huh? So he sent to those people, after that Jeconiah verse 2, the king and the queen and the eunuch and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smith were departed from Jerusalem. After that bunch was departed, he sent letters to the prophets, the priests, and who's the third ones? In verse 1, 
the prophet, the priest, and who? Okay, whoever. You see it right there. Uh, he sent it by the hand of Elisha, the son of Shaphan. He's the one who carried the letter. Saying, look what he said. And I said that if you have a name in the church, you ought to be first. When I say I come with a 15 minutes message, you can tell me that you're a minister in the church. You can't speak for 15 minutes on, on, on turning water into wine or feeding the 5,000. It is just indifference if you can't do that. If, it, if you can't do that, you're out of place. You have been put in the wrong place. Look what he's going to say in verse 4. Thus saith the Lord. Can't you find anything? This? You can't pick up your Bible. When you pick up your Bible, it is thus saith the Lord. Doesn't the Lord speak to you on mornings before you leave home? Doesn't the Lord give you a message for somebody else for you to go down in the ladies' room and give them a message? How come you can't give the whole church a message? Anybody listening to me? Huh? Thus saith the Lord of hosts unto all that are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon, whom I, the Lord, not the devil, caused to be carried away. Look what the Lord said. Let me summarize this before you read it. The Lord is sending them into captivity for 70 years. And he said, when you go to live in Haiti, I'm sending you in captivity to Haiti, Bajans. Up there, that real, real bad. But when you get up there, build houses and live because you're going to be there all the time. Plant vineyards and let them grow because you're going to be there. All the things that you'll do home, do up there in Haiti because you ain't coming back before 70 years. So let's, you want us to read that? No, how many of you understand what I'm just saying? God, he, he's saying, in the, in the blessing of Haiti, you're going to be blessed. So look at verse, verse 5. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit thereof. Take wives and get sons and daughters, get children. And take wives to your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, and that you may be increased there and not diminish. I'm sending you in the captivity, you should increase there and not diminish. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray unto the Lord for that city that I sent you captive in. For in the peace thereof shall you have peace. When there's peace in that city, you're going to have peace. If there's war, you're going to be part of the war. So pray that there'll be peace. Verse 8. I like Jeremiah. He's saying what the Lord says. Not what he feels like. Or what he hears some other pastor says. Verse 8, for thus saith the Lord of hosts. I too love those words. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you. Not only the prophets deceive you, people pay welcome into the church. Don't let the prophets among us deceive us. I had to visit the lady, the pastor visiting from Maryland on Sunday. Most churches, she went in Sunday morning, she taught the platform. Greeting the congregation. Why well, I know who you are. I don't know if you're a witch. I don't know if you're serving the Lord. I don't know who you are. Anybody understand what he's saying? Huh? I don't know who you are. You come here. You, you, first thing she got me scared about is that she's Dr. Prophet. The doctor alone got me scared. What's wrong with just being a pastor? There's something wrong with that. So let not the prophets deceive you. Am I reading this, people? Am I reading? Am I reading this? Let not the prophets deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams, which you cause to be dreamed. When somebody come and tell you, the Lord, show me this in the dream, tell them, talk to the hand. Unless the Lord could give you by his spirit that that person is in the spirit. For, verse 29, verse 9, they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. They prophesy falsely. I noticed that the pastor of the Abundant Life Assembly put up a post today. And he said, do you find it strange that in 65 of the 66 books of the Bible, the only one left out is Philemon. In 65 books, the Lord warned the church against false teachers. He said, what do you think that's so? That's 65. Go read it. Pastor, the pastor from Abundant Life put it up this morning. 65 books the Lord said against false teachers. Why is that so? Only one book, the book of Philemon, and that's only one chapter, 
Then the Lord talked about false prophets. Because false prophet prophesied falsely, verse 9, in my name, and I have not sent them, saith the Lord. I have not sent them. For thus saith the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished in Babylon, then I can visit you, and I will perform my good word towards you, and cause you to come back home. But until 70 years, 70 years is a long time, go down there, build houses, plant vineyards, get married, let your children get married to other people, have children and all that because you're going to be there for 40 years. I'm not changing my mind for 70 years. You are going to be down there. So, verse 11, because I know the thoughts I have for you. You are in captivity now. I haven't totally given up on you. You are still in my thoughts. I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord. I have thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And then at the end of 70 years, you will call upon me and you will go and pray unto me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Emphasis tonight, with all of your heart. We are praying and people are walking around. We are praying that people are on the phone. We are praying and people are doing all kinds of things. Could we just stop that tonight and decide that we, the answers that we need from God really require that we pray? Really, really. We got to pray for ourselves. We got to pray for our families. We got to pray for our marriages, our children, grandchildren. We got to pray for our community. We got to pray for the church. We got to pray for the growth of the church. I was thinking today that there's so many people who ought to know better that think that running the church is easy. You think that run the church is easy, so the fella called in on the program today and said the church got so much money and the church has lost its way and all the pastors are doing the driving Mercedes and having airplanes and all this money and making the bank account big and all kind of stuff. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you. Verse, verse 14. Verse 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart and I will be found of you. The Lord won't be hiding anymore. You, be, look, you, Lord, you need the Lord to do something for you. I will be found of you. And I will turn away your captivity. 70 years is up now. I'll turn away your captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I, not the devil, have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. So the Lord sent me away captive. The Lord said, go and enjoy the place. Because you're not coming back after 10 years. 70 years is a lifetime. What is the Lord saying to us tonight? I will let you continue to read that chapter when you get home. But we are talking tonight about seeking the Lord God. Seeking God with all of our heart. With all of our heart means a whole lot of things. What does it mean to seek God with all of your heart? In order to really find God, this verse is saying that we must seek him with all of our hearts. And we can't casually try to seek God a little here and a little there and expect to find him. We must dive in and seek him with everything we have in order to really find him and get to know him. To seek God with the whole heart, you must be willing to give your life for it. Seeking God with your heart, whole heart is life transform, is a life transforming process and a journey to discovering the true personality of God. You get to know God. So never allow fear to prevent you from seeking God and surrendering to him. This type of seeking God does not happen on Sunday at church. It does not even only happen when you open the Bible once a week. This is a continuous process. And you've got to plow at it and plow at it until you get the breakthrough. If you don't get the breakthrough, perhaps you're not seeking with all your heart. Uh, it, it is not that God is holding on, on us or, or, or that he's unwilling to reveal himself, but he wants us. To really seek him with all of our heart till the breakthrough comes. So, we can't focus on several things at once. Tonight, we're going to focus on Jesus as it relates to the church. The Lord said that there's one thing. We can't focus on so many things. We've got to focus on one thing. One thing. Psalm 27 and verse 4 says, One thing have I desired of the Lord. The Bible has a lot to say about one thing. One thing. I am preaching and your mind is someplace else. I'm preaching and you're, you're, you're on, online in your mind comparing my, ser my sermon with somebody else. By the way, um, Gino Jennings had a complaint today. Gino Jennings all of a sudden is disappointed 
that half of his congregation left. And he's come out and he's begging the other half to really stay and don't let the church fall apart. But he should have known that a long time ago. So since COVID, since COVID, Pegwell Community Church must be the only church that have the congregation and leave. We increase rather than decrease. I don't know if you could tell me another church in Barbados that increased. Half of the population gone. Do you look at Joel Austin when he's preaching? The church is empty. You look at T.D. Jakes, all the empty seats. And there's a reason for that. Not that people don't like God, but people have other sources of getting the gospel. You don't have to be here tonight to hear the scripture, you know. You could be home on YouTube. You could be home someplace else. So people choose not to come out in the rain and come out in the dark. People, people choose not to come out where they can be shot at and whatever. Although if you had gone at Poplar last night, you could have died. Because I had gunslingers right in the car park at Poplar last night shooting. You understand? So you ain't coming to church because of shooting. You're going to the supermarket. And you go to the supermarket and, and you had gunslingers all through the place. Had to shut up the supermarket real fast. So it's only excuses when people don't want to come to church. But when people are not coming to church, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't love God. It means that you could go online and get some, some, something that is not really good enough. And the being in the presence of God, the God said, come to church. And we want to do what he says. So let me give you 15 minutes. Let me give you 15 minutes to seek the Lord with all of your heart right now. Let's pray something about the church. Let's pray. Whatever. Pray for the pastor. I don't care where you pray. Pray for the leaders of the church. Pray for something called succession. Have you ever heard about succession? When you hear about succession, that means people, who, the person who's going to take over from the present person. A succession in Barbados means the person that will take over from me. That's what succession is all about. We don't have a good succession plan here in this church. If something happened to me next week, who will take over? Who will take over? Somebody said, well, we'll call back for Pastor Chantel. You should not do that. That would be a backward step. That would be a very bad idea. But when I say that, so I want to tell her. Um, that would be a very backward step. You don't do that. Nobody don't just leave the way you leave unless God tells you to leave. If you know her, God would tell her to leave. If God tells her to leave, why well, wouldn't I tell her to come back? She's not going to leave unless God told her to leave because she's that spiritual. Okay? So if God told her to leave, let her leave. There's so many people around the place that we could put in place to, to pastor this church and you don't, want to, you don't want to go back down that road. I noticed some, some of you conspicuously are hearing the amen. The, the ones that I didn't expect the amen from, I didn't hear it from. I can understand that because when she left, some of them were just willing that if she could have found some place to open, I would have gone away. She, there's nothing wrong with that. Not everybody got to work for the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. She opens a place tomorrow, half of you want to go, go. No problem with that. She's working for the Lord. The Lord said, if you're not with me, if you're not with me, if you're not with me, if you're not against me, you're with me. So, you know, serving the Lord is nothing wrong with that. Half of y'all could go find a place and join her up and let her serve the Lord. Is there anything wrong with that? Don't, don't, people, don't people leave other churches and come here? Huh? So what, we can't leave here and go someplace else? What's wrong with that? I see nothing wrong with that. God will give us who belongs to us. Let's all stand. If you do not have a local assembly, Feel free to join us for an exhilarating time of worship. Our services are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Sunday evening, healing and deliverance at 6.30 p.m. Join us in prayer on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. And for Bible study on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Bless fellowship and enjoy. The simplicity of the gospel.